Let's take a look at internal assessment today, commonly called the IA. It's an investigation, an experiment that you need to plan and then carry out. How big is this investigation? Well, the IB recommends somewhere between 6 and 12 pages, but that's written in size 12 font. It's supposed to be an aerial font. So it's not really a big project. You need to write quite concisely and you need to be quite focused in what you're saying. Make sure that it's coherent. That just means that everything that you write in your essay should be tied back to your statement of task or your research question. How much does the IA count? It counts for 20%. It's marked out of 24. The other 80% is coming from the exam papers that you write. So how much freedom do you have in terms of the type of investigation that you can do? Well, about 90% of labs would be measurement based. So most of those labs would have a research question with the form, how does the independent variable affect the dependent variable. So how does the angle of the ramp affect the acceleration of the cart? That type of thing. You might also do a measurement based lab where you try to measure some sort of physical constant. In that case your research question would be more along the lines of how accurately and precisely can that physical constant, whether it be the acceleration due to gravity or the latent heat of ice, how accurately and precisely can that be measured using well, whatever equipment you used. You might do a simulation lab, but I would not do a simulation lab that was only a simulation because it's very hard to do uncertainties for that type of lab. But you might combine a measurement lab and then try to verify it with the simulation. Another type of lab would be a data-based lab. So there are banks of experimental physics data out there on the web. For instance, the World Wide Telescope has a data bank or is a data bank. CERN also has a data bank of physics quantities. So you could use this as the data in your experiment. Now you might also do something based on video analysis. In a sense this is still a measurement based lab but the videos that you analyze don't have to be videos that you made yourself. You may be taking scenes from movies etc and analyzing the physics seen in those videos. So how is it marked? Well, there's a rubric, and that rubric has uh, five different scoring categories. The first scoring category is called personal engagement, henceforth referred to as PE, and that's worth two of your marks. Next category is exploration, EX, and it's worth six marks followed by data processing, DP, also worth six marks, evaluation, also worth six marks, and finally communication, and it's worth four marks. Sum up all those marks and it's out of 24 in total. So let's take a look at each of the scoring categories in a little more detail. So personal engagement has two aspects, one having to do with your justification of the project. Did you say why it's important? Why was it interesting to you? Why is it relevant? And the second aspect is, does your work show some personal input? Now overall, you're going to get a zero, one, or a two. So the way I kind of like to think of this overall a zero would correspond to somebody who just wants to get the project done. They're careless in their work, but they've handed something in. So they just 
want to get it done. Somebody scoring a one would be somebody who is careful but follows very standard lab format. So they're not really doing anything creative here. They're trying to do a good job. What I'm looking for for somebody scoring a two is what I like to call an authentic search for truth. In other words, there were some things that you really wanted to find out. And often that leads to you doing creative things to find that out. So you do a new type of graph. You have a particularly in-depth discussion, that sort of thing. So I'm looking for engagement here. And don't spend too much time on your justification here. I had a student start their lab with the words, all my life I've been surrounded by rubber bands. That might or might not be true, but it's not a statement that really gives me evidence of your personal engagement. The second category is exploration, which is really just about how well you plan and design your lab. It contains uh, four different aspects, but in almost all cases, only three of them are marked in physics. So these three are marked. We de generally don't look at safety and ethics. It's more important in chemistry and biology. Typically in physics, the most you're saying is that you need to wear goggles or you need to wear gloves because something's hot. So when needed, make sure that you do address safety issues, but don't obsess about it. First aspect is about the research question. You want that to be clear. A good way to do that is to use the format that I've suggested. How does the independent variable affect the dependent variable? Or if you're doing a lab where you're measuring a physical quantity, how accurately and precisely can the measurement be made? You also want it to be focused. So you don't want to write something along the lines of how does force affect acceleration. That statement's just a little bit too vague. It's very difficult for the reader to get a picture in mind as to what you're going to do. So you might say something along the lines of how does the pulling force exerted by a weight attached by a pulley to a cart affect the acceleration of a cart. Thirdly, I would suggest that you explicitly state the independent variable, dependent variable, and control variables. So in our little example, the dependent variable was the acceleration of the car, the independent variable was the weight over the pulley. Don't go overboard writing about control variables that aren't significant. So certainly the mass of the cart is significant. Uh, you would like to minimize friction as much as possible. But don't talk about the air temperature being constant or there being air currents in the room. These are just not significant in the experiment and you shouldn't be writing about them. The second aspect here is background and this can be kind of a tricky section. It requires some experience and some skills. It's primarily about how to write a hypothesis but it's going to take me a little longer to explain it than I can in this video, so I made another video. And it's called How to Write a Hypothesis. And the last section is the method. Keys to writing a good method. Uh, the first principle is to give enough details so that the reader could repeat the experiment. So you need the details so another person like yourself could repeat. 
some no-nos don't write things like gather the equipment or make a description of what your data table is going to look like or explaining that you need to record your data into a data table uh, you don't need to say that you're going to make graphs the type of thing that you do need to do give details in particular of things that you do to isolate variables. We're looking for good experimental skills. Uh, things that you do to make your measurements more precise or more accurate. You should be telling the reader how many trials, how many increments, and the range of the independent variable. Do give the details of the measuring equipment. So don't just say we measured the volume. Say you used a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder to measure volume. So give the details of the measuring equipment. Also, give the details of the measurement itself. So if, for instance, you're measuring the length of a pendulum, exactly where are you measuring? From where to where? So you'd want to tell the, the reader, say, from the point of contact to the top of the bob. So whether it's a time measurement or a distance measurement, make sure you give the reader the details of those endpoints. Let's go on to the next category, which is data analysis. The first aspect here is about getting sufficient, relevant, raw data. So the relevant data really comes down to did you isolate variables? So that really comes out of your procedure. Sufficient data means do you know, have enough increments? Do you have enough trials? Do you have a big enough range of your dependent variable and your independent variable? And that, once again, should really be highlighted in your method. The following structure that I'm going to show you for a data table works really, really well, and I recommend it highly. Uh, your first column is your independent variable, and we would have the increments in the independent variable going down here. So if you're looking at the length of a pendulum and you're changing that length, then we'd have values here of 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, etc you should have at least five increments as a minimum. Make sure that you write the plus or minus at, in the top of the column heading. Don't put your units in with the numbers here. All your entries in the table down here should just be pure numbers. Your dependent variable will go across the page. So typically you do trials at each increment. So you'd have a trial one, a trial two, a trial three, etc. The number of trials that you do depends on the uncertainty in the dependent variable. In other words, if you've got a really small uncertainty in your dependent variable, you only need to do one trial. And because you'll find that if you keep doing extra trials, you're just getting the same number again and again. So it doesn't do any good to do extra trials. But if you've got a large uncertainty in your dependent variable, then you're going to see a lot of fluctuations here. So you'd like to have more trials so that you can average them and get a truer value. So the number of trials depends on uncertainty in the dependent variable. And typically your next column would be your average value across trials for your dependent variable. And when you're doing trials, you can use the fluctuations in the trials to estimate your uncertainty. So here you could have your uncertainty in the dependent variable just going to equal max minus min 
divided by 2. In other words, you'd look at these five values. If you did five trials, one of them would be the largest value, the max. One of them would be the smallest value, the minimum. Subtract those two values, divide by 2, and you'll get an estimate for your uncertainty. Something to watch out for in terms of having sufficient data. So you might have some data that looks like a straight line, but you didn't get any data closer to the origin, and what was actually happening was more like, a, say, a square root curve. So you want to address that idea of getting sufficient data in key regions. The other three aspects are processing, uncertainty, and interpretation. So processing is primarily about your graphs. Make sure that you have correct calculations, no mistakes. You're typically going to have a graph of the independent variable against the dependent variable. Make sure you have a proper numerical scale. In most graphs, you want to include the point zero, 0, Make sure you have a label and units on both axes. And give the graph a title. It should be a scatter graph with a curve of best fit. That can be done mathematically, but sometimes you really have to do it by hand. Do not join the data points point to point with the little lines. That's not accepted. Now, if you really want to show off your skills and you know how to linearize, and I did make a video on how to linearize, that can really show off your skills and help you to do a much better analysis. Keep in mind that it's not always appropriate to linearize. So you'll actually lose marks if you try to linearize, and it's really not meaningful. And make sure that for any important calculations that you show your work with sample calculations. For uncertainties, uh, in the minimum case, you'd like to have uncertainties in your raw measurements. It's even better if you can explain how you got those uncertainties. Taking it a further step would mean to propagate uncertainties into your dependent variable in particular. Uh, and that can be done, as I showed before, using max minus min over 2, looking at the fluctuations over trials. You could also use your rules for propagating uncertainties. Error bars are important. And you can also calculate percent differences if you've done linearization then you can look at the uncertainty in slope and y-intercept and in particular if you're propagating uncertainties using the rules then make sure you do a sample calculation the final aspect to analysis is interpretation so this is really about how are you calling it so it's about your call meaning are you saying it's a linear relationship when it's really proportional? Are you saying it's linear when it's really square root? And it's important here that you don't say more than your data says. So don't make a lot of assumptions. I often have students say that something's exponential but really all that they could say is that the curve increased slowly at first and then increased more quickly. And typically you're going to need some error bars to get top marks in this category because that idea of a curve fitting through the error bars adds a lot of weight to your analysis. The most difficult part of an investigation to write up is the evaluation. 
it's quite tricky. It really takes a lot of experience to get good at writing evaluations. And because of that, I've made another video where I tell you in detail how to go about writing a really good evaluation. Four aspects to it. One is about your conclusions. Second is about your scientific context. Third is about the strengths and weaknesses or the limitations of the experiment. And the fourth is about the improvements that you would make if you did the experiment again. The final category is communication. First we look at your structure. So have you arranged the report with subtitles and sections? Is it an easy read or do I have to keep flipping back and forth? Do you have things like page numbers? And generally are you following kind of a standard lab format with conventional subtitles like hypothesis. The second aspect, is it relevant and concise? Typically students don't do very well on this and that's because they start doing their writing too late. So their writing is tends to be more like a journal. We write journals so that we can kind of sort out our thoughts. In a report you want to have already sorted out your thoughts. So don't leave writing too late. Everything that you say within your investigation, within your report, should address the research question. Everything you write should help answer your research question. If it's not doing that, it's a tangential point and you shouldn't include it. And then finally, are you using proper scientific terminology? And are you following mathematical conventions and conventions that we use on graphs and data tables, etc.? Are you including your units? That type of thing. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.